and to me, that's why Samuel's doing this. He's pointing out this prophetic type. He drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, There we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. Speaking of Samuel again, 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines, this is an almost perfect picture. It's a beautiful one. Because not only do we have the gathering here, but we got the fight that comes with it. Okay? We got a fight that comes with it. We've got, the, the grand story is, the separation between saint and sinner and the, um, the battle of Armageddon where Christ himself fights with the Antichrist himself and all of his armies. And it's not even close. It's a rout, people. The Antichrist and the armies that come are going to get slaughtered. Our weapons of warfare are so superior to anything the Antichrist and the kingdoms of the world will be able to manufacture or borrow, rent, whatever. Okay? It's, and who's leading the charge? Jesus. And what does he have to do? Just start speaking. Because a sharp two-edged sword comes out of his mouth, and that's how he gets rid of everybody. All right? So that's this picture here, 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. That's their gathering. And were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Demim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. You, they, in other words, they got their armies in place, set the battle in array. But so far, nobody's shooting yet. Nobody's shooting. Nobody's doing anything. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, verse 3, And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side. Mountains. are a picture of heaven in the Bible. You have valleys, which are hell or death. Yea, though I walk through the, nobody ever says the mountain of death, the valley of death, valley of the shadow of death. Okay. Um, Babylon is in a valley. Um, there's other ones. I can't think of them. But you know, Sumeria, Shinar, the plain of Shimar, Shinar. Those are all valleys. They're low places. They represent hell. Um, Moses coming down from the mountain twice. That's Christ coming down from heaven twice. Okay, you see that? Um, you build the temple of God on a mountain. You don't put the temple of God down in a pit somewhere. So just keep this in mind. Keep it in mind because... And I'm setting you up for something. I, I will always tell you when I'm setting you up. And I am setting you up big time for something. If mountains represent heaven, and let's count them, we have the first heaven, which is the atmosphere of the earth, the second heaven, which is the universe, the expanse, 
of what we call outer space, what the Bible calls the heavens. And then three, Paul referenced this, 2 Thessalonians or 2 Corinthians 12, the third heaven, which is where God is. It is the heaven of heavens. In other words, it is heaven's heaven. People or entities, angels that live in the heavens have a place to look up to. The third heaven. Okay? Now, so the Philistines are gathered together on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side so where are they heaven and they descend and fight and uh, and there was a valley between them and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Discover the champion in you. That was Joel Osteen's theme for a while. Discover the champion in you. This word champion is only used one time in the whole Bible. It's right here in 1 Samuel 17. It's the only place. Okay? So Goliath and... <clears throat> I don't have this in my notes, but... Let's look it up here. How long, how many days does Goliath come down and aggravate the Jews? How, how, how many days does he do that? Let's see, that was verse 4. And um, let's see here. Verse 16, And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. How many days did it rain? Fountains of the great deep broke up. Forty days. Fourth kingdom. Okay. See, the fourth kingdom gathers everybody except us. It gathers everybody else together as one, as one man, one great big giant man. There's one collective, one focus, one goal, one theme. Remember under Maoist China, when Mao Zedong was the chairman of the Communist Party in China? How did everybody dress in China? I mean, it takes, they all look alike to a new level, right? Because they all looked alike. Every one of them. You couldn't tell one from another. Because, they I mean, they dressed alike. Every one of them. See, that's communism for you, people. It's communism. Not a good idea. So anyway, then, one of my favorite places in the Bible, one of my favorite chapters, because it spells out the first time the devil tries to kill Jesus and it doesn't work. And the second time he tries to defeat Christ and it still doesn't work. Um, first Kings chapter 20. Let me flip over there real quickly. First Kings, you turn in your Bible there. I don't have it in my notes, but you turn in your Bible there. First Kings chapter 20. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all of his hosts together, and there were thirty and two kings with him. 
and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. So what does this look like? Again, it's like I said last time. How is this going to, how is this going to look like on Fox News when they show it live? What's it going to look like when all these chariots come down? Chariots, not tanks, not armored vehicles, chariots. What's it going to look like on this day when this thing occurs? Okay. And you have Ben-Hadad and you have 32 other kings. Now let's do some very simple math. 32 plus 1, divide 2 plus 1 is 3, bring down to 3, 33, okay, 33. And in 1 Kings 20, when they go to, when they go to battle the first time, they battle on a hill, on a mountain. Where did Christ go? Where did he take the cross to? A hill called Mount Golgotha. Calvary. A mountain, a hill. And there he defeated all the enemies against whom we fight. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death isn't destroyed yet, but it will be. How do I know? People are still dying. Right? So Ben Hadad goes home and his kings, are, they're going, how did we lose this? So they start drinking, they get drunk. Ben Hadad says, ah. and another guy says, what did he say? And another guy says, I, I've heard him when he's drunk before. I can tell you what he said said, okay, they're gods, maybe the gods of the mountains, but guarantee you, they don't have gods in the valleys. So we'll next fight, we'll fight them in valley, and we'll beat them then. And that's where the song comes from that we sing here in America. The God on the mountain is the God of the valley. It's the same God. So when he... Ben-Hadad and his 32, 33 kings together, they gather themselves together again in the valley, which would be Armageddon. What happens in that battle? They get beat again. Okay? Well, better get some more scotch and wine out because they're going to get drunk. Okay, anyway, so we have, we have a, a collective, and, and here's how the Bible divides this up. 32 plus 1. That's how the Bible does it in this, in this chapter. I love this, because this is like a universal symbol. Here is the empire of Japan. That was my Franklin Delano Roosevelt voice. The speech he made to Congress to declare war. And Roosevelt, at, you know, he made, I heard a speech, was watching um, some documentaries on World War II, and Roosevelt declared in a speech um, before Pearl Harbor, I am a pacifist. He did not, he's a liberal Democrat. Okay, I'm a pacifist. I don't have a problem not fighting. And if we can do this diplomatically, let's do it. Let's do it politically. Let's have negotiations so we don't have a bunch of dead bodies laying around everywhere. Okay, not, not necessarily bad politics. But the Japanese war machine, you have to understand, World War II was in every way as much a religious war as it was a political one. Because, number one, Hitler and Himmler were in touch with some pretty bad evil spirits during those days. Himmler doing 
seances and rituals, getting instructions on how to build weapons during those days. But you have the Japanese Empire and the, and the people worshiping Emperor Hirohito as a living God on this earth, as a man God on this earth. And the Japanese war machine religiously for the purpose and the sake of the sun god, Hirohito, they were going to take over all oh, the Japanese. To this day, the Japanese and the Chinese hate each other. To this day, they hate each other. Okay? So maybe to you, they all look alike and sound alike, but no, they know each other and they hate each other. Okay? So notice the symbol of the rising sun of Japan. It is a sun with 16 white rays and 16 red rays. 32 plus the sun, 33. That's Ben-Hadad and his 32 kings. That's the beast and his armies of the last days going to fight the battle of Armageddon to beat Jesus. Not going to happen. A uh, rose compass on practically every map is a, I say rose compass, it's a compass rose. And almost without fail, in every compass rose, you have the center point, and there's always a marker pointing north. Now, it may just be simply the letter N, but a lot of the fancier compass roses will mark north with some sort of symbol, and in many cases, it's the fleur de lis, the, the lily flower. The lily of the valley, the bride and morning star, I will be like the most high, coming up out of the north. So you will have 32 degrees, that's what you have on this map, 32 degrees with one point in the middle, 33. Take a look at President Bush standing at the um, entry lobby to the CIA, which is a rose compass or a compass rose. And notice the, um, the rays extending out. From, not, number one, where is he standing? Now, I don't believe George Bush is the Antichrist, okay? Because, because he can't get elected again. <laughs> Everybody knows that. But he's standing on the center in that 33 spot, and each extending line that comes out, or ray, is divided black and white. So there would be 16 white rays extending and 16 black rays extending. You still have 32 with old Bushy there in the 33rd spot. Okay. Same thing with the Jesuit symbol. And Santa Padre, Il Papa, the Holy Pope of Rome, Jorge Bergoglio, Pope Francis the First, a Jesuit priest. This is the symbol of the Jesuits. A Jesuit priest as the Pope, wielding the power over 1.2 billion Roman Catholics around the world. That's a big army. But notice the notice the the arrangement of the Jesuit symbol. It's still the image of the sun with exactly 
32 rays around it. Some of them are straight. Some of them are serpentine with the 33 with the IHS in the middle. There's our Papa, first Jesuit Pope in the world. And no, I do not, I do not accept this alleged fake prophecy of St. Malachi calling him Peter the Roman. All oh, these prophecies. Well, did you read that? Did you read that guy's book? And, and his, I mean, it's, it's going to happen. He's the last pope and he's the Antichrist. And I don't believe it. I don't buy it. You know why? Because it's not in here. You read the wrong book is what you did. You read the wrong book. Guarantee you. Guarantee you. He's not the Antichrist. Guarantee you. Okay? The UN symbol. I mean, I, I just, one day I was looking at this and, and I just jaw dropped. Because it, it occurred to me that, number one, the center point of the United Nations symbol was the North Pole. Take a look at it. And so then quickly I'm looking at scriptures and I'm seeing that God said I'm going to send an army from the North. From what the Thule Society, well, what the Thule Society called Ultima Thule. A land in the north where they believe this race, this superior race comes from or lives. Man, even Manly Hall drew the, the connection between the North Pole and he mentioned an elf living at the North Pole working with other elves to bring gifts to mankind. Why does he have to live at the North Pole? Can he live in Hawaii? Okay. But then I started, I counted the sections. 32 sections in all with the North Pole being the center point of all of that. And Jeremiah said repeatedly, they're coming from the north, they're coming from the north, they're coming out of the north. Go watch, go watch, um, close in, go watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind for like 594 times. Can't help it. Because every time I watch it, I pick up something new. Because Spielberg, I'm telling you, that guy... The, the more I find out about UFOs, the more I find out that he had something. He was on to something. The mothership came out of the north. That's where it came from. The, the end part of the movie, the mothership came out of the north and met the 12 disciples at Devil's Tower. It did. Okay. Now, speaking of meeting... 12 groups of people or 12 people at Devil's Tower, Wyoming. Several years ago, I read a book. Uh, it was written by a, might have been an Anglican minister or something like that. And it said, God drives a flying saucer. And this guy, even though he was uh, like a church minister, was hypothesizing the idea of what if, what if, what if. Sort of like Aaron Von Daniken with Chariot of the Gods. What if, what if he, what Ezekiel saw wasn't God coming down in a chariot? And Von da I've heard Von Daniken say, God does, it. The, the real God does. I was raised Roman Catholic. I went to a Roman Catholic school and I re realized God doesn't need a chariot. If it's real God, he doesn't need a chariot. Why does this God need a chariot? So anyway, I'm going... Um, this, this guy writing this book, God Rides a 
flying saucer, drives a flying saucer. He said, what if these stories in the Bible don't actually explain God and man and whatever, but it explains man meeting up with extraterrestrials? And he specifically referenced the meeting of God's people at Mount Sinai of the 12 tribes at Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. And he said, so let's, let's imagine that what they saw and heard at Sinai, Sinai was not God, but it was some sort of, of spaceship. And I'm going, oh, this guy's weird. But then Spielberg, when he makes Close Encounters of the Third Kind, he actually puts a scene in the movie where um, Terry Gar, the mother, says to the children, okay, it's bedtime. The, one of the little boys, who I think was Richard Dreyfuss's nephew, grabs the TV, turns it around, because, you know, we used to put them on those trays back then, turns it around and says, but Dad said we could watch the Ten Commandments. And it's on the telly right then. And I'm going, and it's what it is. It's a, it's a literary piece or an artistic piece to show it's a foreshadow in the movie. Because there was a project in the movie where the government had selected 12 people, 10 men, 2 women, to go on the spaceship and go with the aliens. But the aliens had gone around and picked 12 people of their own that they wanted. And Richard Dreyfuss' character was one of them. That's why he is compelled now to go, not to Mount Sinai, but to Devil's Tower, Wyoming. And Spielberg, I've read, there's a whole book I have on the making of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It's a big book. And it's got all the director's notes in it and everything like that. And Spielberg doesn't really recall how he came up with the idea of, of um, you know, Dreyfus' character uh, going up into the spaceship or being selected or the number of people or whatever. Now, I don't necessarily believe that. I think, I think he exactly knew where he got the idea from. It was given to him either in document form or by inspiration, one of the two. But that's exactly what he did. Now, having said all that, here we go. You know me. Here we go. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 8. Ezra is recalling what's happened. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, Yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now God said, I'm going to scatter you among the nations. But he said, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven. Where, where would they go? In heaven, I mean. In, um, in space. Where would they go? There's a second witness to this. And we read this the last time. Deuteronomy 30 verse 4. If any of thine, pe if any of thine be driven out unto the ut outmost parts of heaven. From thence will the Lord thy God gather thee. Gather thee. And from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Where would they go? 
if they were in the outmost part of heaven, where would they go? And I'm being dead serious. I accept the Bible as it is and take it for how it was written, which then causes me to look at verses like that and not assume that it doesn't mean what it says, but it causes me to ask God, what did you mean, Father? Why did you say it that way? Why did you say that they would be in the outmost part of heaven? Why would you do that? Okay? Think about it. Do your own study. Um, Nehemiah 8.1. I love this one. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street. That was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Oh, woo! Getting a Holy Ghost one here. Revelation chapter 5. Man, I love it. Revelation chapter 5. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Ezra is acting the part of the Lord Jesus Christ when delivered to him was the book of the law of Moses and the book of the law of Moses written on both sides. So you cannot add to nor take away from the word of the Lord. And what Ezra is going to do is he's going to read the law to them. And they're going to sit, they're going to sit there for however long it takes for Ezra to read this. They're going to sit there and listen to it. Why? Because they're hungry. They've been in Babylon in captivity for 70 years. And they're starving to death for the word of God. And they can't get enough of it. And when you get right with God, you can't get enough of it either. And this, this was then foreshadowed by even Christ himself in Luke chapter 4. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. Oh, look at that. Number one, it's on the Sabbath day, which is the beginning of of the thousand year reign, the seventh day, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Then he, it was delivered to him. Now he's ready to take the book. He's worthy to receive the book. And it's the book of Isaiah, which has ding, 66 chapters. Your Bible having 66 books. It's a microcosm of the macrocosm. It's a little picture of the big picture, the real event that's going to take place when the book is handed to Jesus and he opens the book. And when he opens the book, all of these things start happening now. God starts fulfilling one prophecy, one scripture after another, after another, after another. The gathering is part of that. Psalm 50, verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Psalm 50. 50 was the day of Pentecost, the 50th day. 5, for the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. So gather my saints together, but not like, you know, St. Mother Teresa, St. John Paul II, not, not those. Only those that have been made part of the covenant by a sacrifice. And the sacrifice in this case was the only sacrifice that could be allowed, Jesus Christ. 
And we have been made part of that covenant people by the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, you and I will be gathered together with the elect to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And then Psalm 102, verse 18. This shall be written for the generation to come. Listen, listen to this. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Two things here. This shall be written for the generation to come. Generation is a gene word. In other words, it's the new people that this is written for. The new people. The ones who've been born again. The ones who have been remade. The ones who have been created new. Let's read it again. This shall be written for the generation to come and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Shall be created. Now, Adam was created. Eve was created. And the rest of it is history. The rest of it is just, hey, baby, you are beautiful. Let's get married. And then pretty soon, four or five children later, they all die off. The children get married. Same thing happens. One generation cometh after another. Right? But in this case, these people are going to be created. I'll share with you what I think it means in a minute. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner. Paul said we gro- all creation groans together. Why? Because we're on earth. And it's miserable down here sometimes. Um, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and His praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. When the people are gathered together the people which shall be created, the generation to come. Who are those people? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Those of you who used to be Roman Catholic, would you go back to bowing to an idol ever again? Yeah, you wouldn't. Why? You had a new heart. And your new heart says, number one, I don't have to do that. Number two, I don't even want to. I don't want nothing to do with it. Amen? That's a new heart. That's a new, and God create, create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David said that in Psalm 51 after his sin with Bathsheba. Create in me a clean heart. Galatians 6.15 For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, which essentially is a new creation. The people which shall be created. In other words, the born again people. Joel chapter 2, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Seven. Seven trumpets. They marched around Jericho seven days. On the seventh day, blowing the trumpet seven times. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. 
assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Here it is. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber, of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. What are we doing in that closet, Jesus? Praying. Isn't that what Jesus said to do? If we find ourselves, if you ever find yourself in a closet, what should you do? Pray. Okay. I mean, you got a walk-in closet. You go in there looking for something to wear. Why don't you stop and pray every now and then? And I'll be honest with you, I've literally done this. In the worst, the worst period of my life, I put myself in a closet, shut the door, and I prayed. I howled unto the Lord. And he heard me. He's still been hearing me to this day. And this beautiful, in this beautiful language, this Bible, gather the people so the bridegroom and the bride can come out of their places. And it's, it's wedding day. It's what it is. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Nowadays, wolves... Come in wolves clothing and people fall for it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. So, do men gather grapes of thorns? See, we're getting down to the nitty gritty here of who, who gets gathered into what pile. So if you're from a thorn bush, do you get gathered with the grapes? Or do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Uh, let me read it back up. A double witness to that. And yeah, Hebrews, the dreaded, oh no, Hebrews, going to read Hebrews 6, that's not for us, that's for Israel. Hebrews 6, 7, for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So the showers come down, which is God's doctrine, and it brings forth fruit out of us. Verse 8, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. Same thing he's saying here. Do men gather grapes? Do men gather born-again Bible-believing Christians from the NIV? Or from the New American Standard? Either one of them. There's two of them. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Every tree... Remember that fasces and the bundle of sticks? They gathered the bundle of sticks together for their strength, but they are taken to the battle of Armageddon. And what happens to them when they get to the battle of Armageddon? They're all taken and cast where? Here it is. This is where we're going to end it. The wheat and the tares. Who gets gathered first? Where do they get gathered from? And what happens to them? Matthew 13, 37.
He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. What, what is the seed that conceived us into the kingdom, to be children of the kingdom? The seed is the word of God. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Other Bibles, false doctrine, Buddhism, whatever. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. It's ex it's, he's saying... This is exactly how it's going to happen. Now, who does the gathering? Do we gather ourselves? No. The Holy Ghost, the angels, gather us. And does, any, does anybody that's gathered as wheat take the mark? No. Why are you still worried about it? Um, verse 40 again, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels. They shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. And Brothers and sisters, some people spend more time on the internet warning people about Fauci and Bill Gates than they do warning people about the consequences of sin. And that's wrong absolutely wrong he shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there should be wailing and gnashing of teeth and then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear and since I can't say it any better than that I'm going to close it here. May the Lord bless you as you give attention, more attention to His Word than you do the lies that are being spewed everywhere else. May the Lord bless you with His goodness. May God's people find in you the peaceable fruit of salvation, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, forgiveness, faith. I didn't get all nine of them. I never did. May God's people find in you the fruit of righteousness and the fruit of love and peace. God bless you. You're the reason why I do what I do. Thank Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all those that have prayed for me and my wife dealing with, we're now into the, um, I would say the restoration part of our house, okay, and it's going to be a while before we get to live in it again, but thank you for your prayers and your support. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.